All right, well, uh, welcome everyone to today's meeting for the Open Bitcoin Privacy Project. We have Mr. Samuel just joining in right now. Hey, Samuel. He may be muted. There he is. Hello. Hey, good to see you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about a few projects that are kind of um, either things that I'm working on or uh, people that are um, going to be working with the organization in the near future. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of them aren't able to make it tonight, but um, I'm still going to give you a rundown about what's, what's going on with those projects. Hey, Nathan, are you there? He was for a moment. OK. Um, is there anything that people want to bring up before I sort of get started on that? All right, cool. So uh, let's see. <clears throat> so there are a number of different projects. So basically, we have projects that we've got planned for uh, OBPP. And I've also been contacted by a number of different individuals who are working on projects, and they're looking to get involved with the, the project, uh, attach their projects to our organization, see if they can get other people to kind of join into their projects and get some collaboration going. So um, for all those who are present now and the people that are going to be uh, viewing live or viewing, watching the recording later on, I just wanted to sort of give a rundown of what those projects look like. And um, if people are interested, they can uh, get in contact with us and, and uh, get involved. Um, so since Chris is here, I guess we may as well start off with some stuff that he's working on. Uh, he's been working on Bitcoin Authenticator, uh, Android uh, Authenticator for a while. Um, and he's also working on a coin join implementation. Chris, would you like to just tell us a little bit about um, about those projects? Yeah, sure. So it um, I started off the with it was just an Android app that I developed. Um, I, I kind of was uh, not too hot on these multi-sig services that were coming out where they keep. Your your second set of keys on on their server, and uh, not that that's a, necessarily a bad security model, but it's a bad privacy model because you have to send all your transactions to their server. So right. um, I just kind of created an Android app where you would keep the second set of keys on your phone, and um, you get a little notification on your phone when you make a transaction, and you just approve it. Um, and from there, it kind of developed. Um, I was just thinking about. Uh, well, I originally wanted to see if I could persuade any developers to incorporate it into their wallets, and I get a little, little support. But um, uh, I was just going to try and maybe like fork like a more popular wallet, like Multibit. But Mike Kern suggested to us, he's like, "How about you just use the, the Bitcoin J library and just build a, a wallet to go with it?" So that's basically what we've done. And I've kind of run with it. I was originally just going to make like a little demo wallet, but I figure, you know, if I'm making a wallet, might as well make it a really good one. So I've been trying to trying to make a wallet that really uh, kind of meets my standards um, for security and privacy. And it's still a work in progress. We have an alpha version out, but um, the wallet hooks up with the Android app, and you can um, use that for two-factor authentication. Um, I've talked with uh, Christoph some. Um, one of the things that I, I want to overhaul um, as it relates to, well, for my wallet, but in, in general for Bitcoin, is how we use um, Bloom filters. There's a, a paper published, I don't, actually don't know when it came out. I think it's fairly recent, um, from some cryptographers, looks like Germany. Um, the title is on the privacy provisions of Bloom filters and lightweight Bitcoin clients, and um, basically the and th there's not a whole lot in there that we didn't already know, but they have some really solid numbers behind it, and um, basically the the conclusion is that the the existing Bloom filter implementations are full of privacy leaks and really offer almost no privacy at all. Um, so, you know, there are some recommendations about how, how to go about fixing that. 
Um, and when I was talking with Kristoff, I think part of it is we have some limitations in BIP 37 um, that kind of prevent us from actually addressing it. So the issue with uh, the, the privacy leaks with how their bloom filters currently work is you um, uh, you create a filter with which it achieves a target false positive rate when you fill it with a certain number of addresses. Let's just say 50, for example. Um, but the way it works is you you start adding as you generate more addresses in your wallet, you start adding them into your filter. And if you have less addresses in your filter than say that 50, um, then your actual false positive rate is going to be less than your target rate. And this paper shows that when it's substantially less than the target rate, so let's say you only have one or two or ten addresses in your filter, um, that it, it, they can basically guess your addresses with a really high probability, like 90 percent, 95 percent probability. So that's a one source of a privacy leak. The other one is as you keep adding addresses into the filter, your privacy, um, your, um, I should say your false positive rate keeps increasing and eventually it, get, it starts getting really high and so the recommendation and what Bitcoin J currently does is it resets the filter, resizes it and then sends that over to the, the peer you're connected to and the problem with that is it could, the multiple filters can be intersected with like a 99 percent probability they can figure out your addresses. So if you're sending more than one filter to your peer which is basically the default behavior of Bitcoin J um, it, it, you might as well not even be using Bloom filters because it's just like handing over your addresses directly to those peers. So one solution that um, people have talked about before is you can just create like a one large filter containing all of the addresses that you would ever intend to use and um, and then persist that to disk and just reuse that filter over and over again. Problem with that is you're just using way more bandwidth than you really need. Right? I mean, how how many addresses are you going to pack into this filter? You know, a thousand, five thousand, maybe more. Um, and the average person might only use you know ten, fifty addresses. So you're using like you know more resources both on the wallet and from the node than you really need. Um, a solution that the the paper tries to present, which um, well, it, it's basically you create a, a filter, let's say 50 addresses, and when you need a um, more than 50 addresses, you create a second filter and persist both of them to disk. The problem there is BIP37 only lets you set one filter per peer, and so to try and kind of hack around that limitation is like really awkward. Let's say you have 10 filters and you got to re-download the chain 10 times, you have to have one filter per peer, and that makes it easier to, to, to like lie by omission and I mean there's just there's really no good way to kind of go about doing that handling multiple filters so one kind of proposal that I think I'm probably going to make on the, the mailing list is to uh, update BIP 37 or maybe it would be a new BIP um, so instead of handing a single filter to your peer you can hand them a list of filters um, so and we can still keep the, the maximum filter size is 36,000 bytes. We can still keep the maximum size of all filters combined at 36,000 bytes. We just add, um, make it possible to add, hand a list of filters to that node. And I'm pretty sure that would work for the most common address types, the, the pay to pub key hash and pay to script hash. I still have to do a little more research and see if it would work with pay to script hash um, because there's some other um, there's three different types of flags you can use with the Bloom filter regarding how the peer, if the peer adds more um, data into your filter, which would kind of increase your false positive rate and and kind of necessitate resetting it again. Um, but I, I think this would work. So I have a little bit more kind of testing I need to do, see if it works with pay to script hash. And if it does, I'll probably propose that on the mailing list and see, see if I can't get that... Um, that change implemented. I think it would be relatively uncontroversial. I don't see it adding a whole lot of overhead um, and it would actually be less overhead than just just uh, handing your peer one giant filter. So if that um, new BIP or that change to the BIP was accepted by the community, um, what would it take to actually get that implemented in presumably Bitcoin J, which you're using for your wallet software? Mm -hmm. 
So what would it take for that to actually get implemented? Um, well, I'm not uh, I'm not that great in C++ and and not familiar with the the core code. So I don't know if you guys um, if you guys yourselves or anyone interested in writing that. I mean, it would be a relatively small change to the protocol. Um, I don't think it would be that much work to actually uh, write the pull request for it. Um, and then I don't know. We'll see if it has. The only the only one issue I could see with it is that each node would be calculating more hash functions if you have more filters, but and still you're not going to be calculating that many hash functions that it would be slowing it down. Um, so I, I don't see it being that controversial, although I could be wrong. Very interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um... I was just curious if Justice has any thoughts um, around um, sort of the BIP process and appealing to different uh, wallet developers and so forth. Do you have any thoughts, Justice? Yeah, I was going to suggest that uh, maybe he tried to get it implemented in LibBitcoin and in VTCD. Um, the, right now, the, like, the BIP process is broken. And also, the process via which peer-to-peer -peer nodes advertise their capabilities is broken because um, you, need to, you need to go through the bit process in order to get a new flag added. So that's kind of problematic. I mean, one of the things that we would really need is a, a more flexible way for nodes to in the peer-to-peer -peer network to say, hey, these are the things I support. Because... Um, I think I think the Lib Bitcoin guys want to use prefix filters instead of Bloom filters, but um, they have no way to just for a Lib Bitcoin node to say, "Oh, by the way, I understand prefix filters." What we should, uh, yeah. you know, what we should really have is this an extendable uh, system where peers could just query, you know, hey, client could say, hey, what do you support? And the server can reply, and then you don't have a central committee deciding what features are or are not advertisable on the network. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be done as a service bit. I mean, that was one of the issues with um, Bloom Filter. Some people wanted to see it done as a service bit. Um, I, my only concern would be, I, I don't know, I guess you could bump the versions on like Bitcoin or uh, BTCD or LibBitcoin or what have you, but it would just be, it would be incompatible with the existing um, Bloom filter code. Or not necessarily, well, not necessarily incompatible, but um, it would be backwards compatible, but not, you know, not compatible with nodes that don't support it. Right. Um, You'd advertise it as a different feature. My one you know, issue and with, the new yeah. nodes could, could advertise old style bloom filters or new style bloom filters. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know how. It, maybe you guys know how they plan on doing. I, I can understand prefix filtering if you're using like data and op return. I don't know how they plan on doing it without using op return though. Um, I heard like prefix um, uh, brute forcing, which sounds like a really bad idea to me. I, I don't know what you guys think. Uh, I'm not familiar with the details of how the prefix filters work. Yeah. I guess my general concern is just that uh, people should be able to add new capabilities and advertise them, and if clients want to use it, fine, and if clients don't want to use those capabilities, that also fine. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Although we only have, we have only 32 in the current protocol, 32 um, service bits, but we've only used two so far, so we still have quite a bit of room. Well, and I, I don't think service bits is a, a good mechanism. Because like you said, there's 32 bits there that have to be rationed. Um, yeah. There should be you know, some other kind of mechanism that can be arbitrarily extended. Yeah. Cool. Chris, did you want to, um, where are you at with like coin join stuff for your wallet? What do you have planned? Yeah, all right. I'll talk a little about that. So you guys are probably familiar with the coin uh, coin shuffle um, paper from earlier this year. Um, uh, Tim Ruffing is, I guess, the 
lead guy on that. He posted on the development mailing list that he was looking to try to get it implemented in some wallet. And um, so I emailed them back and I was like, hey, I have a wallet. I'm you know, willing to work with you to try and get it implemented. And so we, we emailed back a couple times. I actually haven't heard from him in like a month. I gotta gotta write them back. But um, so one of the um, issues with Coin Shuffle, um, I guess, or Coin Join in general, is what communication channel do you use for it? And I asked him, at, you know, what he had in mind, and he's he said, well, you know, I didn't really have anything in mind. Um, that's kind of a you know more of a, a difficult um, part to figure out. And so I spent quite a while, you know, trying to think about how we could do this. I'm talking to Kristoff, you know, can can we use BitMessage? That doesn't really work that well. You have the proof of work, and so I, I just came to the conclusion that if you're going to do it right, might as well, you know, write the communication channel from scratch. So I started writing a like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, communication channel just for CoinJoin, and um, it follows a lot of the the Bitcoin protocol specification. But I'm switching out the um, transaction block messages with what I'm kind of referring to uh, session session create and session join messages. Um, so anyone would be able to create a new coin join session, and that session will get relayed around between all the other peers, and then anyone can join that message by broadcasting a session join message. And so every every peer would be able to get a basically a list of um, what what sessions are out there and who who's um, participating in those sessions, uh, which should um, uh, to some extent uh, you know hopefully prevent the kind of Sybil attacks, which is one of the kind of main attacks on on CoinJoin. So if you can't if uh, the messages are reaching everyone, um, you can't prevent honest peers from from joining the uh, the CoinJoin session or Coin Shuffle session. You need at least you need at least one other honest person in the in the transaction for the um, the coin shuffle uh, protocol to provide some anonymity. So um, hopefully we can achieve that if we can make all messages reach all peers. And the way I'm I'm planning on kind of preventing um, uh, spam on the network is uh, the the messages, both the coin or the the session create and and session join messages are you're going to have to attach. Um, your input, assigned input, um, to the to the message, and so um, it won't get broadcast if the input is valid, or if it's used in another um, active session, it, it won't get broadcast. Um, and then maybe the session. Do you know if, if do you know if that idea is similar to what Darkcoin does, where you have to offer up collateral assigned uh, inputs uh, that get pushed through if you um, don't complete the transaction, basically? Um, no, this isn't collateral. Um, you, you don't lose anything if you don't complete the transaction. But the coin shuffle protocol has a way of booting out the um, misbehaving participants. So if somebody does try to create um, uh, sessions that they have no intention of completing, they would just kind of slow down the protocol, but they wouldn't stop it from running because it would just it would just boot them out. Um, so. Yeah, we'll we'll check the make sure the input is valid. Um, it's not used in any other message, and then the we'll we'll probably have like a time limit on how long the um, sessions stay open for. So maybe after an hour it'll expire. So at most, if someone wanted to try and like spam the the network, they would only be able to broadcast one message per input they have over some dust value per hour, um, which is not really a DOS. And so, and at that point, I think we're going to make the default behavior of the wallet is going to be to um, it'll j we'll just start with the the first um, or the oldest uh, session. It'll try to join the oldest session that makes sense for its you know how much it's looking to mix. Um, and then yeah, if someone's misbehaving or not participating, they get booted out, um, which might slow it down, but it won't stop it from from um, taking place. So. If there are, if someone does create those sort of arbitrary um, sessions, um, it shouldn't it shouldn't stop people from mixing their coins. Um, now, the the another concern is how do you how do you do this privately? And I our wallet already connects. Um, we already can make outgoing connections over Tor automatically. We're using an internal Tor library um, in Java. 
So our, our connections to the Bitcoin network are already over Tor. I'm planning on using the same library for CoinJoin, um, but then connections over Tor, which means we have to set up um, the peer has to run as a hidden service, and I think I'm probably going to um, like include like a Tor binary inside the application and um, automatically configure it and, and to uh, work as, as a hidden service. So the the whole coin join network, when it's done, it hops over Tor. Um, and so right now, um, I'm just doing kind of like the sort of the network infrastructure. This this peer-to-peer -peer network is really just for discovery of other um, people who are looking to enter a coin join transaction. And I'm actually writing it so it's going to be it's going to be like agnostic to what actual mix protocol you use, whether you want to use Coin Shuffle or something else. In the the um, session create message, you'll 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 put some bytes in there um, suggesting what uh, telling people what um, mix protocol you want to use. So the one we're going to use is going to be Coin Shuffle, obviously, and we're going to make direct connections. So after you discover the other peers on this network, then the participants in the transaction will go off and make direct connections to each other and um, complete the, uh, the mix over, over their own connections. Um, but it could be done some other way, too. The peer-to-peer the -peer network's just going to be Again, it's just going to be for discovery. So if someone else wants to use the peer-to-peer -peer network and then use some other, um, you know, other mix protocol um, or other uh, communication channel for actually completing the mix, they can do that. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'm. I'm maybe like 50% done with this peer-to-peer -peer network, and then I got to finish that and then implement the actual shuffle part. That's really really cool. Um, I'm excited to hear about all of that. You should definitely make sure that for the uh, the hidden service, you add a CAPTCHA field that uh, reveals the IP address to the world. Yeah. <laughs> so are you looking for uh, collaborators on the wallet at all, or are you pretty much happy with the resources that you have? Um, well, yeah, I mean, if people want to want to help work on it, um, it's, it's me and one other guy I got uh, alone is my other partner. He, he lives in Israel. Um, and we're kind of, I, I'd like to be, if I could work on it full time, both of us could work on it full time, we could get stuff done a lot quicker. So we're kind of looking to see if we can't get any any kind of funding to allow us to work full time for maybe like a year or so, eight months or a year. Um, we, we had a conversation with some, I don't know, investors in Israel. Um, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I mean, if people want to work you know, want to work on it in their spare time, I'm certainly, you know, open to people helping out. So, um, just, what it's would be the, Java. the monetization strategy in that in that case? Well, um, I don't know for CoinJoin specifically, but I, I think for the wallet, what we're uh, going to kind of play around with is we have this, I don't know if you guys have seen the Hive wallet, they have like an apps menu in there, kind of have the same thing in our, our wallet if you check out the beta. Um, some of those those apps are going to be like free apps, like um, for example, connecting to the Android app is a you know free service for the multisig. But then we're going to add some more, um, some in there that we can potentially monetize. Like I don't know, I might I might ask for for the coin join. I might ask for like a couple buck donation to activate that app in the wallet. I mean it's open source, so um, you know people could fork it you know, take that part of the code out if they wanted to, but I think it would, for most people, they would just rather pay the couple bucks to uh, to activate that app. We also are working with um, uh, Coinapult. They're, uh, they're um, uh, going to implement their uh, locks um, in, into the wallet, so if you want to use the Coinapult locks, um, and we get like a small cut of the profits from that. Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to a related project. Let me do my uh, screen share here real quick. So there's some guys, and possibly ladies, I don't really know, in um, San Francisco. They have like a Bitcoin devs meetup, and I guess they've been working on kind of a wallet for a while, uh, Bitcoin JS lib wallet. And then um, one of the guys, or a couple of the guys, actually forked that and they have a coin shuffle uh, enabled version of the wallet 
So um, I got a contact from Brian Vu, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, but he's uh, interested in uh, linking up in, in the future. And so I'm curious um, if he or any of the other people in that community might, might be interested in uh, collaborating with you on your project. Yeah, I think I saw. Did he give a presentation recently on Coin Shuffle? I think I saw that. I haven't seen it, but he may have. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Well, thank you for the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Any wallets out there using that Bitcoin JS? Um. Hmm. Or is it just the? Uh, let's see if there's anything indicated on the GitHub. I don't think I've actually heard of anything. I think it's more like it's it's been more like little hackathons that they've been doing. Um, yeah. You know, we're just working on their spare time. I'm not sure it's a anything. Uh, definitely seen, seen Tariq on GitHub before. I don't remember where. Anyway, so um, yeah, I'd be curious if. There may be other people like that that would be interested in collaborating on your projects, especially since it's open source. Yep. Cool. Um, anything else you wanted to add about what you're working on right now, Chris? Uh, that's just it right now. I got I got the wallet going, the Android app, the CoinJoin, those three, trying to fix the boom filters. Very cool, very cool. That's awesome stuff. And... Um, are, is there anything that you're aware of right now that this organization can kind of help uh, push those efforts forward? Um, I don't know. I mean, if you guys want to, you know, help, you know, maybe test out the alpha version, see what you think of them, find any bugs, or I don't know if you guys um, want to help code the uh, pull request if we ultimately get to that point, um, or I don't know, reach out to the people in the other. Um, implementations and see if they're interested in adding that. Um, or just in general help, you know, collaborate with ideas on how to, you know, fix some of the more privacy bugs that we have. Yeah, very cool. I think at the very least I'd be interested in helping out with the testing because that's something that uh, doesn't require a huge time investment but still pretty useful, I think. Um, cool. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, yeah, so I wanted to bring up the the other coin shuffle guy. I don't have too much more to say about it other than what I've said so far. And um, uh, just a couple other things I want to kind of go over. Justice or Sam, uh, is there anything that you guys wanted to bring up at this point? I wanted to mention that I did register um, the... A Google Plus page for Open Bitcoin Privacy Project and Gmail account, and uh, I haven't done it yet, but that should let us um, create like shared Google Docs and calendars. And uh, remember, we that we were going to collaborate on some like wallet reviews and stuff. Yes, absolutely. So let's let's talk about that next. Actually, um, so. What we kind of figured out at our, our last meeting was one of the, the low-hanging fruits in terms of moving Bitcoin privacy forward is to for us to kind of do reviews of existing clients that are out there, give them um, some, some type of objective scoring um, in terms of how well they're doing in terms of privacy and potentially other um, other attributes as well, like security and usability and so forth. Justice pointed out that if we just give them a privacy rating, they'll they'll probably just all fail. So, um, so yeah. So I think that's it's a really it's a good thing to focus on. One of the things that I wanted to ask folks during this meeting is um, just off the top of your head, what are some Bitcoin clients that you would like to see? Uh, receive this kind of scrutiny um, so you can start building kind of a list of, of clients to look at. Obviously, there's Bitcoin Core, um, blockchain.info, um, what else? Green Wallet. Armory, Multibit. Multibit. Uh, mycelium. Airbits. 
we could even, um, I don't know if Chris feels comfortable doing it during his beta period, but we could do his uh, app as well. Chris, can you remind me, uh, what's the URL where we can find your, your wallet? It's um, bitcoinauthenticator.org. I'm, I'm debating on, you know, if the name the the wallet something else. I, I picked that name ju when it was just an Android app, and right. now that it's a, a wallet with it, I, I never really came up with a great name for it. So that's something else you guys can help up with if you can think of a, a decent yeah. name just for the wallet. I think you could use a new name because it's yeah. that doesn't really explain all, all that it is at this point, so. Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, I guess it's all right for just an Android app, um, but for the, uh, you know, the wallet should probably be named something else. I've just been referring to it as Authenticator Wallet in the code, but can do better right. than that. Yeah. I didn't hear um, Electrum in that list, though. would be a good one as well. Electrum, yep. That's good. Good, good. All right. Uh, there's a lot more too, but um, that's a good that's a good list to start off with. I think there's a. Do you have like a place to collaborate, um, like a mailing list or a Google group or something? Um, or a, yeah, I guess it would be a group. Yeah, uh, maybe a Google group would be <clears throat> most convenient. Um, I don't know if that needs to be linked up to the page or how that stuff works. Do you know, Justice? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Uh, so Chris was sort of suggesting maybe we should have a Google group to help collaborate um, online. And I was wondering oh. if it needs to be linked up to the Google page that you've created or how that stuff works out. That would probably be helpful because then you could use the group account to administer the Google group or you could use the page account to administer the Google group account that way. Okay. Okay. So uh, you are a manager on there so if, if you like change your identity to that group page you should be able to go to Google groups and then register the, the group. I'll do that. I'll do that. All right. Um, yeah so we should definitely get some some group action and some drive action, necess if necessary, to uh, spread this info around. All right, sounds good. How, how are we going to go about in determining what the uh, criteria is for judging the wallets? Good question. Um, I would be really open to hearing any ideas right now if people are feel prepared to, to share them. Well, I think that's one of the first documents we should create is the metrics. We start collaborating on what are the metrics and how will we rate things before we ever do any ratings at all. Do you, do you feel uh, is, it, is now a good time to start discussing I'd say degree, those metrics? Degree of trust in other people is probably a, a, a valuable metric. You know, how much trust do you have to place in other people with your privacy or security? Right. I think some categories can be uh, binary as well. So you know, does it use HD or does it not? That kind of thing. Yeah, that that could be. That's more of like a, a feature list, though, because like it, okay, if if you're rating them for uh, for functionality and security and privacy you might not necessarily be interested in exactly how they do it as much as that they do do it. Right, yeah, so it doesn't have to, HD is, yeah. about, is about like uh, pr uh, eternal backups and not reusing addresses. So right. these are, those are the features we really care about, whether they implement it with HD or some other system, like maybe a pure stealth uh, address wallet would not use HD, but it would accomplish both goals. Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying you you want to have more um, subjective categories that we we determine what the inputs are for what those categories well, I guess are. I think more behavior like a behavioral model as opposed to a feature driven model. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, that yeah, that's how I would describe it. Yeah, I think we should have 
I think we should st one of the first documents we should start on the drive is just uh, just listing listing the behaviors we want to rate how how we would rate them. We don't have to decide right away, but even start to think about how would we weight different categories in terms of importance. And then once we're all kind of like satisfied with the methodology by which we'll rate, then we start reviewing wallets. Right. Yep. This this might uh, be a question for another time. We can we can table it, but. Uh, do we have sort of a, is there an effort to create a general baseline for where we are at now in terms of Bitcoin privacy, generally speaking, and then also the ideal of where we want to be in the future? I didn't understand the first half of the question. What do you mean by a baseline of where we're at? Because it's, it's different baselines for different clients, uh, clearly, right? So what, what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah. Um, like what's the sort of average client looking like these days? I, I, I suppose, yeah, I'm talking about more of, again, a subjective, a general, like for the average Bitcoin user, how far away are, are we from the privacy that we as a group are looking to get to? Right. Well, I think you can get a sense of that almost purely by just looking at the top couple most popular wallets. I think blockchain.info is hugely... Um, impactful in that regard and they definitely are for want of many <laughs> different uh, new features and, and changes to the behavior of the wallet from a privacy perspective. Um, I don't think there are any lightweight uh, clients that that really meet our, our standards. Um, uh, I mean what, right. what we want is something that offers you a really high degree of, of privacy um, with basically zero trust in, in somebody else. And I don't think there are any at this point that offer that. Right. Um, you know, maybe we can get there if we can fix this bloom filter issue or if, you know, uh, prefix filters um, end up, uh, you know, being a thing. Um, but at the moment, I, I think if you really want privacy, you have to use the, a full client. Well, uh, the other thing to consider, I think that answers your question is we want to make sure our metrics include behaviors that we know that most or none of the wallets can achieve. Right. I don't know if you remember, it was kind of a meme a while back that in terms of video game reviews, the only possible score, the lowest possible score is a 7 out of 10. Yeah. So you don't, you don't want to be like that. Uh, we build the matrix so that most of the clients if not all of them, end up getting low scores so that we can track the improvement over time. Right, and that's what I'm getting at again, but the baseline is, you know, five years from now, um, if we are closer to what we want to see as the ideal, are we going to be able to actually show that? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we build a set of tests where most of the wallets out there are probably going to end up between a one and a three. And then you, you do a batch of reviews and make a nice table out of it, and that's our starting point. And then over time, that table will start to look better and better, hopefully. Okay, good deal. And then one other quick question. Are we, looking, are we solely focusing on clients as the thing that we are looking to sort of uh, review and rate? What are some other things that we could potentially rate uh, that are not clients? Like services? Yeah. Um, yeah, services out there, or even uh, projects like, for example, Bazaar or Open Transactions. Because uh, I know, like, right now, one of the big things we're dealing with is uh, a pull request came in for Tor integration. We're looking to try to do that. So I don't know if that's helpful to users or not. I would think, at least to start off with, we might want to limit the scope to wallets and things that behave like wallets. Right. What about Coinbase so, um, as a thing to evaluate? Well, yeah, I think their Coinbase as a wallet is something we could evaluate. Um, right. 
I mean, it would have to. You'd pretty much have to give it a zero for privacy, just yeah. due to its nature. <laughs> but you can evaluate you, the other you aspects. Do of it. numbers on this scale. <laughs> If you're okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't. We don't want to uh, start off too broad. There's enough work to do anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, clearly uh, there are some services that are also wallets. So yeah. Uh, so you know, for example, with Open Bazaar, I'm motivated to try to give some evaluation of Open Bazaar and to track its improvements over time in terms of privacy, but to try to compare it numerically to a Bitcoin wallet, I think would be kind of an apples to oranges thing. That would, I'm not sure how that would work out. So, um, yeah. All right, very good. Um, so would people, so in terms of identifying these behaviors, <clears throat> do we want to uh, just put, up, put that off until we create the Google a uh, drive document that then people can start adding their thoughts there, or do people want to discuss it a bit more right now, or what's what's the preference? Uh, I prefer discussing it in the document. Okay. Works for me. All right, very, very good. So, all right, so we talked about all this stuff. Um, as far as that collaboration goes, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, Justice? I don't have any anything off the top of my head. All right, cool. Well, thank you for bringing that up. So one last thing that I wanted to get some feedback from you dudes about um, just the last day I spent a couple hours putting together this little web application, uh, which I've given the somewhat vague name of Torban. So <clears throat> let me screen share real quick. Uh, all right, so um, there is this paper that came out in the last week, I guess, called Bitcoin over Tor isn't a good idea. And uh, has everyone uh, heard about that story or taken a look at it? I think some nodding. So like general idea was you could, uh, since there's this like DOS protection bit in, built into the Bitcoin network, um, you could abuse Tor exit nodes, like connect to a bunch of them, get them kicked out of the Bitcoin network, uh, launch your own Tor exit nodes, and make those like basically the only Tor exit nodes that can be used to connect to the Bitcoin network, and then you can start futzing with people's stuff if they're using SPV and whatnot. Um, so I created this like little web app. Um, all it does is it gets stats from a, a tour status page, all of that gets all of the exit nodes that exist right now. It pulls down a list of all of the connected Bitcoin nodes from bitnodes.io and it compares the two and so it gives you a snapshot in time of which uh, tour exit nodes are being used currently for uh, connecting to the Bitcoin network, right? And then it stores that in a database and then it continues to refresh this every five minutes and it kind of tells you um, you know, okay, so here's a list of all of the IP addresses that have fallen into that mutual category. What, what's been going on with them? Have they been dropping off one of those lists? Um, have they been staying on? And so if you, that the idea is that this would give you some information about whether an attack like the one described in the paper uh, was being carried out. It's definitely not like a a perfect or ideal, it may not even be a very good way of giving statistics about that, but I thought it was like a reasonable start. And so I'm just curious if people have any feedback about this this type of approach for identifying that, that attack in progress. Yeah, so that list would drop to zero if that, that attack was done, right? Yeah, so would it drop to zero? Uh, no, it wouldn't drop to zero. Basically, the only nodes that would be left would be the ones that are run by the attacker, but um, uh, right, yeah. either the attacker would drop them all at once. Like, So 
they'd have to do <laughs> they'd have to either very slowly over time drop nodes and replace them with their own and hope that no one figures this out, or they'd have to do it over a short period of time, in which case you'd start seeing lots of nodes dropping much more quickly than you would expect, like more than is historically the case. And so uh, you, there'd be some pattern recognition there. There's probably a way of graphing this data that would make it more obvious. Um, that's pretty easy to do once we start getting the raw data. But um, yeah, just so that, that sort of makes sense. Yeah, I could maybe even add some code into my wallet where when it if it keeps getting dropped by um, Bitcoin nodes to keep like a count of how many it got dropped by, um, and that would that would be a good indicator. Like if it's having a hard time connecting, you know, there's seven thousand Bitcoin nodes and it's picking, you know, a dozen at random. If it, you know, tries a, you know, a couple hundred and or even a couple dozen, then it, it uh, can't connect to them. Something might be up. Right. Right. This uh, might be something that Dimitri or others from Mycelium might be interested in looking at, because I know they were looking at moving to Tor by default, um, so they're going to have to deal with this issue some way. Right. So I guess um, some people that are connecting through Tor will do it through a hidden service uh, that's set up explicitly for this purpose, um, you know, like a Bitcoin a Bitcoin node that's operating as a, a hidden service. And there are a few of them that are out there that are listed publicly, like, but just a small handful of them. It was on the order of like maybe 10 or something like that. One of the weird things that seems almost kind of off about this to me is like, on average, you're usually seeing about 10 of these nodes up at once. And that seems like a very low number to me. I'm a bit confused by why that is. I would expect to see much more people uh, connecting to the Bitcoin network through Tor, but it seems awfully low. Well, OK. It's um, running a hidden service that has a dot .onion address is more complicated than just routing your Bitcoin traffic over Tor. Um, I guess not a lot of people have the skills or knowledge to do that. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, more, it's more involved. and. Um, I should check that list and see if any of the hidden servers I run were on that in that paper. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah, as for the, the as for the hidden um, the dot onion sites, they're listed on the Bitcoin Mickey somewhere. I found them when I was sort of looking into this. It's probably not an exhaustive list. I guess you can't even really could you come up with an exhaustive list? I don't know how you would do that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the details about how how the peer-to-peer -peer network does peer, uh, like other node discovery, but presumably if you connect to enough nodes and ask them for their peers, or eventually you would get a, a pretty good list. Right. Right. Well, that list is supposed to include. Um, uh, outgoing connections, right? Not just to hidden services, but to the regular, regular IPv4 network. The the list on the web application. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 every single Bitcoin node uh, intersected with the list of exit nodes for the Tor network. Okay. And the okay. thing to remember about that list. What's that, Justice? Uh, I was saying the thing to remember about that list is that the IP address that uh, that your source of nodes is seeing is not the IP address that's actually running a Bitcoin node. That's just the Tor exit node. Right. But it, it would so be... Using it's, that node. What's that, Chris? I mean, I guess you could have multiple uh, clients going through the same exit node. Man, that could be why the list seems smaller. Yeah, you certainly could. I think it's statistically unlikely. Yeah. Given that there are quite a few exit um, actually the the list of exit nodes is not huge, but 
it's much bigger than this for sure. Um, you would expect to people to see, to see people end up using like. No, I guess not. Never mind. I'm, th I'm thinking of guards, but they really don't have anything to do with exit nodes at this point. So. Maybe there are a lot of exit nodes configured to only allow port 80 and port 443 out. I think that is the case. Um, I When I sort of monitor Tor channels, you often see a lot of exit node operators talking about what ports they do and do not allow. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's, you can query that information from the exit node directory, though, right? Um, query it from the exit node directory. Yeah, I think there's but, a way to do that. Yeah. yeah. There would have to be, because if, if some Tor yeah. client somewhere wants to say, hey, I want to go out on port 8333, it has to be able to find out which exit nodes are going to allow that. Right. So maybe the, the next stage of this web app would be find the list of exit nodes that potentially could connect to the Bitcoin network, which is going to be smaller than the... It's going to be a subset of the total exit node list. And then see how well distributed the... Uh, the connections are among that list. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Sorry, I was just muting myself so you don't listen to me typing. Um, yeah, that would be a good a good next step and interesting to find out about. Maybe. Um... Maybe we need to encourage people in the IPv4 network to make their nodes listen on port 80. That would increase the amount of exit nodes that could connect to them. Although, um, if we do that, we would ne not need to make sure that uh, sending HTTP requests on the Bitcoin port doesn't cause it to crash the client or something. That would be unfortunate. Hopefully it's a bit more robust than that, but uh, who knows. Uh, well, yeah, uh, hopefully. I wouldn't get my hopes up, though. <laughs> It's not lacking in resiliency. It's just a quirk that needs to be replicated in all the other clients. Exactly. The code defines the protocol. I'm going to ask in the BTCD channel what would happen. So while Justice is doing that, um, uh, is there anyone else that wanted to bring anything up before we start wrapping up for tonight? All right, cool. So, Chris, um, one thing down the line that I can help with is to um, like encourage media attention on your clients whenever you're ready for that. So, if that's something you're interested in. Um, you know, through the World Crypto Network, we can. There's various shows that we can set up interviews on, and and uh, tutorials. I can do tutorials for dark news, wh whatever it is that you need to get some more attention. Because it sounds like it's going to be a really kick-ass wallet, and so I want to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. Yeah, thanks. Um, my internet's just skipping out, so I, I only caught part of that. But yeah, I'll I'll let you guys know when uh, when uh, you know I'm I got a, like a stable version that I. Cool. I have a follow up question for you, but I'll I'll save it until uh until after we sign off because you're lagging out there. And, yeah. Yeah. All right, and uh, Justin, Sam, anything else? Um. Just quickly, I noted that we're trying to integrate Tor and OpenBazaar. Um, we got a big pull request to do that, and we're working through that right now. 
looks like it's not going to make it into 3.0, which is coming out in probably a week, but, but it'll be in 4, which will probably be out in early December. So hopefully um, Tor integration will be happening uh, early December. I do think that uh, folks will need to run a, a hidden service locally. And so, uh, Chris, if, if you have suggestions, you mentioned that there may be an easy way to get that set up. Um, if you have something I can look at, that'd be very helpful. I thought that the hang up with that was, uh, what was it called? Zero Q something? Yeah. Um, they didn't support uh, SOX 5 or whatnot, but actually the, the latest update did support it, so now it's not an issue. Okay, fantastic. That's great news. Yeah, it was very good timing. Um, just uh, wanted to add one other thing. I was ignoring the um, IRC chat, but um, by the way, if anyone wants to sort of hang out and talk to other people that are involved in the organization, they can do that on Freenode on channel OPBB. OBPPs, rather, and um, uh, if you just Google for like Freenode IRC or whatever, you'll find the little Java Java server or the uh, JavaScript application that will let you do that. And uh, sorry, so Juan uh, was saying in terms of like clients and stuff that we could evaluate, he was sort of wondering whether altcoins would make any sense, like Darkcoin and. Um, uh, yeah, crypto note and, and those kinds of things. I'm ambivalent about that, but I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say about that. I would I would suggest you know Bitcoin should be the the primary focus, and if after we've got that nailed down, which is significant in of itself, right? You know, then then we want want to do altcoins, that's fine. I mean, if there's a, you know, privacy-focused altcoins specifically, you know, might be worth spending a little time on. I mean, I'm interested myself in, you know, like how, basically updates, like how zero cash is going, and because I, I don't follow them that closely, but right. I would, Bitcoin will obviously be the you know, primary focus. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, I know a fair amount about dark coins, so I could, for example, once we have this set of criteria, it would not be difficult for me to compare the reference Darkcoin client uh, with these these standards and give it a rating. Um, so, yeah, I don't. I guess it wouldn't it wouldn't really hurt to do that. I do agree, though, that really our our primary focus should be on uh, these Bitcoin clients. Like it's it's a higher priority for me to to get through these different Bitcoin clients first before we start looking at altcoin clients, but. Might be worth looking at down the line. Is this group also meant to try to be sort of a unified front to uh, to weigh in on proposed Bitcoin changes, uh, putting more emphasis on the privacy side of things? That's a good question. Um... I'm certainly open to that. I don't follow <clears throat> Bitcoin development closely enough to like have really strong opinions about that stuff, and I'm not sure that anyone would particularly care what I have to say about that in the Bitcoin development community. Um, but if, if, I guess I'll put it this way, if there are people that want to... Um, that want to be involved with this organization who want to have efforts like that go forward, I'll be very happy to support them in that endeavor. It's not something I would initiate on my own. Does that make sense? Sure. And another question as well. Um, how closely have you guys talked with the folks at the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, uh, Michael Goldstein, Daniel Krawitz, those folks? Because I know they have, I think there's a lot of overlap, basically. Right. Um, yeah, we have talked with them, both Justice and I. Um, we both uh, asked if there were maybe um, ways to kind of link the organizations. They were pretty um, down on the idea at this point. Um, 
so sort of my, my thought on that is that, you know, let's get some shit done and come back to them in a few months and see if they change their minds. I certainly can, for, for, if I'm putting myself in their shoes and they're not, they're not really sure whether anything is going to be accomplished with the organization, then to have um, all these little rowboats, you know, coming outside <laughs> the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto Institute and not really getting anything done or doing things that are not necessarily under their control and not really in line with their views on Bitcoin and so forth, like, that's a risk to them. So um, if I'm in their place, I would sort of want to see a bit of track record first before they allow that to happen. I, w I will say that um, in terms of Michael and Daniel, I see them at least once a week just because we're all here in Austin. Right. Um, well, and that actually may or may not help, but that's kind of another discussion. But uh, it's more like they're, they're more willing to collaborate on specific projects than merge the organizations. That um, doesn't really fit with their goal. I, I, right. The, uh, I guess the, the SNI isn't really that kind of organization that's looking to grow in that kind of fashion. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm, I'm just glad to hear that you guys have you know, reached out and chat with them and whatnot. I'm sure that there will be some ways to collaborate in the future. Um, so, and I didn't, I didn't know actually you guys were all in the same area, so that's, that's cool. Yeah, they go to the, I mean, we all go to the Austin Bitcoin meetup. They've also got uh, an economics meetup on Mondays. Yeah, we actually have two regular Bitcoin meetups per week here. And so I see them quite a bit. Very cool. Yeah, I know there's, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of like common interests and common values between the two organizations. So I won't be, wouldn't be surprised to see us doing a little bit of a collaboration down the road. But uh, right now it's, I don't know, not, not, my, not a top, top prey priority for me, I would say. All right, anything else before we uh, thin it, wrap up for today? Very good. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, for coming along. I'm really interested to hear in all the stuff that you're working on. It's all like really high quality, fantastic stuff. So I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, we'll we'll meet again in uh, another week or two. Um, I'm going to be setting up the the Google Drive and Google Groups stuff so we can get the collaboration going. And um, just again, a general thing: if there's anything that I can do to assist your projects. Um, in terms of promotion or testing or whatever it is, please feel true, drop me a line and, and let me know and uh, I'll, I'll do whatever it is I can to uh, help out. All right, guys, have a good night. Sounds good. Thanks, Christoph. See you. Take care. Bye.